I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. Today's episode, guys, is going to be slightly different. It's going to be part history video, but then also part discussion video. And I'm hoping that this video will, will spark a bit of debate uh, amongst you and your friends. So by now, guys, for those of you that have started school, hopefully in your history classes, you've already started on the topic of, uh, of how Native Americans made their way over to the continent of North America. And then later on in your class, you're going to learn all about Christopher Columbus and the Roanoke Settlement and the Jamestown Settlement and the pilgrims that would sail to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and they would start the first Thanksgiving. But hopefully amidst all the stories and all the lessons you guys are going to be learning about, at some point, your teacher brings up the name John Winthrop and the boat called the Arabella, or also known as uh, the Arbella. And the reason that this should be brought up, not because you're going to be doing too much of a deep dive into it, but hopefully uh, it becomes a touchstone for a larger discussion topic, which is American exceptionalism. Now, you guys might already be familiar uh, with the phrase American exceptionalism. You know what I'm talking about. We are the absolute best at everything that we do. Nothing that we can do uh, is incorrect. We rock, you suck, USA, USA, USA. And yeah, the citizens of the United States do have a lot to celebrate and be proud of. Just a couple off the top of my head. Uh, our military is the largest and the strongest in the world. Our economy is booming. And why shouldn't we brag about how awesome we are, huh? I mean, we make the best movies, the best music, and the best television right? Our food is better, our cities are more famous, our sports teams are celebrated all around the world, people want to come here every single day to study in our universities, our technology is something that everybody wants. Face it, we are exceptional, right? In some regards we are, but then in some cases we're not. Like for example, when it comes to education, the United States ranks 38th in math out of 71 developed countries and 24th in science. When it comes to healthcare, yes, the United States spends more than any other developed nation on the planet when it comes to healthcare, yet we rank lower than other developed nations like a couple off the top of my head, the UK, Australia, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands. But, 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 to save face, we, we are the nation that, uh, that imprisons more people than anybody on the planet. We currently have over two million people behind bars in this country. Now, don't get me wrong, guys. I'm not trying to upset all of you hardcore, diehard America lovers out there, okay? I, too, am a big lover of my country, and I firmly consider myself to be a patriot. And yet, even though I know that the United States is not the perfect union that we are achieving to become, how is it that we've managed to inflate our national ego so much? With that question being asked, I now take you back to the name John Winthrop and the ship Arbella or Arabella, which in 1630 led a fleet of other ships towards what was known as the New World. Now aboard this ship and the other ones that made up this migratory fleet were Puritans that were escaping religious persecution from England at the time, okay? What they wanted to do is they wanted to uh, freely celebrate and freely express their own religious ideals, but at the time in England, they were, they were being persecuted. They were not allowed to do such a thing. So Winthrop led this fleet of ships, which carried about a thousand Puritans towards what would become New England on April 8, 1630. And Aboard his ship, Winthrop delivered a speech entitled A Model of Christian Charity, which basically laid out why the Puritans had to be successful once they reached the New World and the steps as to how they could become successful. In the speech, Winthrop claims that heading to the Massachusetts Bay Colony was an agreement between the Puritans and God. He wrote, quote, We have taken out a commission. We have hereupon besought him a favor and blessing. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then hath he ratified this covenant and sealed our commission and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. But if we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us. So Winthrop is basically saying to the Puritans, look, we, we cannot take this journey lightly, guys, okay? We have to take this seriously because we've come into this agreement with God. And because he is a generous and benevolent God that is going to allow us safe passage to this new world, we have to, in return, be as successful as possible so that we can praise his name. And how exactly would the Puritans succeed once they reach this new foreign land, Winthrop stated that they had to be, quote, be knit together in this work as one man, 
We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. In other words, guys, we gotta be one team, one mind, one unit, one body. That is how we go out there, and that is how we win. If you play sports, you probably hear variations of this speech in pregame hype warm-ups from either your coach or your captain. And then we get to the most cited portion of the speech. The reason why Winthrop says that the Puritans cannot fail once they drop anchor in the new world is because they must be, quote, as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. In essence, he's basically saying that they are the ones that everyone is going to look at as an example. They're the ones that made it here. They're the ones that are going to set the standard. And if they screw this up, not only will everybody talk ill of them and make fun of them, but they'll also be abandoned by their God and they'll have to figure this out on their own without his help. Now to me, there are two ways that you can look at this speech. One, you can look at it as it's an incredibly uplifting pep talk, right? This is basically the way uh, for Winthrop to boost the morale of the Puritans and be like, come on guys, we're gonna get out there, we're gonna rock, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna settle ourselves, we're gonna make a life for ourselves, we're gonna be able to, to celebrate our own religion freely. We got this, we're gonna do it, and God is on our side. There's no way we can lose, we have to succeed. But then the other way that you can look at the speech is it's kind of, it's kind of full of itself, in a weird way, don't you think? I mean, the eyes of the world were upon them? Really? Nobody else? The, the, the world isn't looking at anybody else except for, except for this small group? What about, the, uh, what about the previous expeditions to North America? What about all the previous expeditions that were sailing all around the world during the age of exploration? Man, I tell you what, Winthrop must have thought his people were, were really something special, huh? I mean, I guess you could even say that he thought that they were exceptional? Yeah, I brought it full circle. Now Winthrop obviously wouldn't have known this, but when he gave this speech in 1630, in a sense, he was sort of planting the seed for what would grow into the mighty tree that we call American exceptionalism. I mean, one can argue that in calling themselves a city upon a hill, that mindset sort of bled over into our national identity. I mean, for example, in 1776, when Thomas Paine released Common Sense Guys, he wrote in the introduction of the pamphlet, quote, the cause of America is in a great measure the cause of mankind. That is a pretty braggadocious statement. Following World War II, when the United States finally became a global powerhouse, it took it upon itself to become the defender of democracy and the leader against the rising tide of communism. John F. Kennedy, in a speech in 1961, just before he uh, took the oath of office to become president, invoked Winthrop's words, saying that the eyes of the world were upon the United States in the early 1960s. Ronald Reagan in the 1980s often compared America to a shining city upon a hill, a beacon of freedom for everyone around the world to admire and to want to be a part of. And here's the thing, guys. I firmly believe that America could be exceptional. America should be exceptional. We have the tools to do it. We have the tools to, to, to reach the level of what is quoted in the Constitution as that more perfect union. But I also believe that in our pursuit of becoming exceptional, we first have to recognize our faults, our failures, our mistakes, and our shortcomings. Now there are probably gonna be some people that come across this video, hear what I have to say, and probably throw some insult at me towards, based on how I look, and they'll throw out the cliched line in some variation of, love it or leave it, punk. Because there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in the United States that firmly believe that America is the greatest country on the planet, full stop, and if you don't like it, or if you question anything that it does, you are not a true patriot. You need to get out. And that is a dangerous mindset to be in, guys, because to me, when you start thinking in those terms, you stop becoming a patriot and you become what's known as a nationalist and an ethnocentrist. You firmly believe that no one else comes close to your nation, nothing is wrong with your nation, everything is perfect, even if there are mistakes happening all around you. Nope, everything is totally fine, everything is okay, everyone else sucks. Frederick Douglass best summed up what it means to be a patriot. He said, quote, I make no pretension to patriotism. So long as my voice can be heard on this or the other side of the Atlantic, I will hold up America to the lightning scorn of moral indignation. In doing this, I shall feel myself discharging the duty of a true patriot, 
for he is a lover of his country who rebukes and does not excuse its sins. It is righteousness that exalteth a nation, while sin is a reproach to any people. Let, imagine your favorite sports team, right? You are a fan of the sports team. You've been a fan of them your whole life. Maybe your dad or your mom was a fan of them, and then you gradually became a Regardless, you are a fan of this team for life. They are your team. Your team starts making bad calls, bad plays, which leads them to lose games, and they start losing games on a regular basis. Do you keep saying a lot? that no, they are still the best team on the planet? Hell no. You immediately start questioning their decision making, their coaches, the players. You start becoming an armchair analyst and start throwing out ideas that they should take on so that they will become a much better team. You start cursing and shouting and berating this team. But does that make you less of a fan of that team? No. It doesn't. The only reason that you're acting the way you're acting toward that team is because you know that they have the ability to be better. And you get upset when they mess up because you know they're capable of bigger and better things. And it's the same thing with the United States, guys. When we win, we win big and we celebrate, okay? As we should. But when we screw up, and we've done that more times than I can even count, we're gonna get upset. We get angry, we get frustrated. And it's not because we hate the country. It's not because we hate who we are and what we stand for. We hate it because we know that we can be better. Now, like I said, I know this isn't the typical history video that I do on a, uh, on a weekly basis for you guys, but this is something that, uh, that I've been thinking about for a little while now, and I, and I wanted to present it as a video uh, to you guys, not just to watch, but to also kind of use as a springboard to, to discuss it, to discuss this topic amongst, uh, amongst your fellow students. And I really hope that this video uh, gets shown in history classrooms so that the students in the classroom can engage in some lively debate and lively discussion about this topic. And teachers, don't be afraid to dive into this topic. Embrace it. Treasure it. Show your students that learning can be done outside of the textbook or a worksheet or an essay. That by engaging in, in vigorous debate between each other, respectfully, they can hear each other out and they can hear other sides that they might not have thought of. And that, my friends, is it for this episode of US 101. Thank you guys so much for watching and let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. American exceptionalism. Do you think that uh, America has the right to be boisterous and to be braggadocious? Or do you think that if we understand our mistakes and understand where we screw up, that that will lead us to becoming exceptional because we recognize where we've gone wrong and how to correct it. As always, guys, thank you so much for, uh, for watching the videos and, uh, and for subscribing to the channel, for liking the videos, sharing them, leaving comments in the comment section down below, guys. It, it's your involvement that, uh, that lead to these videos being made and my excitement uh, of, 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 of making them. As always, you can follow US 101 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all those links down below in the description box. Guys, I will see you um, next week with either an episode of US 101 101 or uh, or grad school 101 actually speaking of grad school i uh i have to go to class because school has started for me so i have to go and do things and learn and get an education so i can get my master's degree you guys learn read study do the homework okay when you get the homework done you have more time for fun oh my god that rhymed i am trademarking that i am trademarking that phrase